In this final segment, we'll go beyond the 7% covered by local superclusters and examine the universe as a whole. At the end, we'll quickly review all the territory we've covered since we began our journey exploring the dimensions of the Earth. So let's start with a look at some of the objects photographed by Hubble that lay beyond our local superclusters. This optical image shows the massive galaxy cluster Abel 2029. The large elliptical galaxy visible in the center of the image is IC 1011. It is surrounded by smaller galaxies. This galaxy cluster has a red shift that indicates that it is one billion light years away. Chandra's X-ray image of this red diffuse emission shows hot intergalactic gas heated to about a hundred million degrees by the enormous gravity in the cluster. This is the optical blue and X-ray red-orange composite image. IC 1011 at the center of Abel 2029 is the largest galaxy ever seen. It is six million light years across, 60 times larger than our Milky Way, and it contains around 100 trillion stars. You might recognize NGC 4319. It is a galaxy in the Virgo supercluster. Of interest now is the small light at the upper right. It's the quasar called Markarian 205. It's 1.1 billion light years away. Markarian is a relatively nearby quasar. Many quasars reside much further away. Quasars are distant galaxies that have extremely bright cores. These powerhouses of light are probably fueled by massive black holes. This is a close-up look at the brightest distant magnified galaxy in the universe known to date. It is one of the most striking examples of gravitational lensing, where the gravitational field of a foreground galaxy bends and amplifies the light from a more distant background galaxy. In this image, the light from a distant galaxy, nearly 10 billion light years away, has been warped into a nearly 90 degree arc of light in the galaxy cluster. The galaxy cluster that is bending the light lies 5 billion light years away. Abel 370 is one of the very first galaxy clusters where astronomers observed the phenomenon of gravitational lensing. A powerful collision of galaxy clusters has been captured by Hubble and Chandra. This clash of clusters provides striking evidence for dark matter and insight into its properties. The observations of the cluster indicate that a titanic collision has separated the dark from ordinary matter. Max J0025 formed after an enormously energetic collision. Using visible light images from Hubble, the team was able to infer the distribution of the total mass, dark and ordinary matter. Hubble was used to map the dark matter, colored in blue, using gravitational lensing. The Chandra data enabled the astronomers to accurately map the position of ordinary matter, mostly in the form of hot gas, which glows brightly in X-rays, pink. As the two clusters that form J25 merged at speeds of millions of miles per hour, the hot gas in the two clusters collided and slowed down, but the dark matter passed right through the smash-up. The separation between the material shown in pink and blue, therefore, provides observational evidence for dark matter and supports the view that dark matter particles interact with each other only very weakly, or not at all apart from the pull of gravity. This is a combined ESO Very Large Telescope and Chandra image of the newly discovered galaxy cluster called El Gordo. It consists of two separate galaxy subclusters colliding at several million miles per hour. 
we are seeing what this cluster looked like when the universe was only half its current age. Hubble is a supernova machine for probing the early universe. Here's a Type 1a it found that's approximately 8 billion light years from Earth. It exploded so long ago that the universe may have been decelerating under its own gravity instead of accelerating as it seems to be today. 8 billion light years is about as far as we can go with supernova standard candles. Beyond this, we only have redshift. In 1996, Hubble trained its eye on a small part of the sky where nothing had ever been seen. No planets, no stars, no galaxies. The Hubble Space Telescope's time was very valuable, and some thought that this was a poor use of its resources. The exercise could have turned up nothing at all. But pure human curiosity won out. In the direction of the Big Dipper, the patch of sky was no bigger than a grain of sand held out at arm's length. Hubble kept its aperture open for 10 full days. When the aperture closed and the image developed, they found over 3,000 galaxies. Every spot, smear, and dot in the image was an entire galaxy, with each one containing hundreds of billions of stars. Spectral analysis of the light showed a redshift that indicated some of these galaxies were 13 billion light years away. This made them the youngest galaxies ever seen. In 2004, they repeated the experiment. This time, they looked in the direction of the Orion Nebula, took 11 days, and used upgrade improved sensitivity instruments. This is the resulting picture. It's called the Ultra Deep Field and contained over 10,000 galaxies. This is the furthest we have ever seen into the universe. We've talked about the Big Bang and how long ago it happened. The age comes from Hubble's constant. Remember that the Hubble constant is the ratio of how fast galaxies are receding away from us to their distance from us. This astronomical value is used to determine distances, sizes, and the intrinsic luminosities for many objects in our universe and the age of the universe itself. As simple as force equals mass times acceleration, we have a galaxy's velocity equals the Hubble constant times its distance. This gives us the velocity if we know the distance. It also gives us the distance if we know the velocity. It also tells us that as time goes on, the distances to galaxies will increase, and if we look backwards in time, the distance will decrease. In fact, Hubble's constant gives us the time it would take for the distance to reach zero. You can see that the age of the universe, as we see it today, depends completely on the exact value of the Hubble constant. With the current best value for the Hubble constant at 13.6 miles per second per million light years, we get a time of 13.7 billion years for the most distant galaxies to get as far away as we see them. You can see why astronomers and astrophysicists are using all the tools in our distance ladder and dozens of more sophisticated techniques to continue refining the value of the Hubble constant. This work is ongoing. We are going forwards and backwards in time with this blue balloon because it helps illustrate the nature of the expanding universe. Simply put, space itself is being stretched. New space is being created all the time. It's stretching everywhere and in all directions. It has been since the beginning when there wasn't any space at all. If you watch the light wave on the balloon as it passes through the expanding space between the two galaxies, you'll see that its wavelength grows longer. It gets stretched along with the space it's passing through. This is what creates the redshift. 
The further away the source of the light, the more time the light has had to stretch. This gives us Hubble's Law. Information from studies of Type 1a supernova confronted astronomers about five years ago with the stunning, unexpected revelation that galaxies appear to be moving away from each other at an ever-increasing speed. In other words, the expansion of the universe seems to be accelerating. Not having any idea how this could be happening, physicists speculate that there is a thing called dark energy that is doing it. The nature of this dark energy is not understood. You'll remember from our segment on local superclusters that galaxies form larger structures called filaments, or walls, that may span between several hundred million light years to one billion light years. By collecting distances to thousands of galaxies in a narrow strip of the sky, it is possible to produce a slice of the universe, like this one from the 2DF Galaxy Redshift Survey. In 2003, this survey looked out into the universe to 3.5 billion light years. These types of plots show how clustered the galaxies in the universe really are, even on the largest scales. There are about 52,000 galaxies in this plot. Between 2000 and 2008, the Sloan Digital Sky Survey conducted one of the most ambitious and influential surveys in the history of cosmology. Over eight years of operations, it obtained deep, multicolor images covering more than a quarter of the sky and created a three-dimensional map containing more than one million galaxies. These are the color-enhanced slices through the survey's three-dimensional map of the distribution of galaxies. Earth is at the center, and each point represents a galaxy. Galaxies are colored according to the age of their stars, with the redder, more strongly clustered points showing galaxies that are made of older stars. The outer circle is at a distance of two billion light years. The region between the wedges was not mapped by the survey because dust in our own galaxy obscures the view of the distant universe in these directions. Working with the Virgo Consortium of scientists from the Max Planck Institute in Germany, the survey put every data point into a supercomputer and produced the largest 3D image ever created. Here we are zooming into and panning across that image. Here you cannot see individual galaxies or even galaxy clusters. What we see are superclusters linked together in filaments or walls in a gigantic cosmic web. In this view of the cosmos, the great Virgo supercluster is just a dot. There are more stars in the universe than there are grains of sand on all the beaches of Earth. This is the big picture of our universe as we understand it today. We've come a long way from our start, triangulating the size of the Earth. Our story really began in the 1500s, when Copernicus proposed that the Sun was actually at the center of our solar system, and we were in orbit around it. A hundred years later, in the 1600s, Tycho Brahe used parallax to measure distance to planets. Around the same time, the likes of Johannes Kepler and Galileo demonstrated that the Sun was indeed at the center and we were orbiting around it. This was the beginning of our cosmic distance ladder. By the 1830s, telescopes had improved and parallax was used to measure distances to nearby stars. For the first time, we knew that stars were trillions of miles away and must shine by their own light. This extended our distance ladder reach to nearby stars. The 20th century, saw non-stop advancements in the field of astronomy. It started early in 1913 with Hertzsprung and Russell developing the HR diagram that could be used to calculate distance from a star's spectroscopy. 
Around that same time, Henrietta Leavitt gave us Cepheid variables as a standard candle. RR Lyra stars followed shortly after that. These tools were used to discover the size of the Milky Way and our place in it. In 1923, Edwin Hubble, using Cepheid variables, discovered that stars and galaxies existed well outside of the Milky Way. In 1930, the famous Indian astrophysicist Subramanian Chandrashekhar solved Einstein's equation for a black hole and type 1a supernova was added to our distance ladder. In the same time frame, broad-based research on the brightest H2 regions and the brightest globular clusters demonstrated that they are good standard candles, giving us an expanded distance ladder capable of full Milky Way galaxy coverage. In 1936, Hubble discovered that the universe was expanding. This gave us Hubble's law and redshift as our final distance ladder rung. These foundations, developed in the first half of the 20th century, made the discoveries of the second half possible. By the 1990s, the Hubble Space Telescope was opening new horizons that stretched to the very beginning of time as we know it. We entered the 1900s thinking that all the stars in the universe were in the Milky Way and that we were at the center of the galaxy. We left the 20th century with great space telescopes probing billions and billions of light years into the cosmos across the full electromagnetic spectrum. Indeed, we have come a long way. But we see some of the effects of dark matter, but we don't know anything about what it really is, even as it appears to be what the universe is mostly made of. We see that the universe appears to be expanding at an ever-increasing rate, but we don't know why. Is it being pulled by masses much further out? or pushed by dark energy within. If it's dark energy, then we have to admit, once again, that we don't know what it is. And even the stretching of space calls for continuous reduction in the energy of each and every traveling photon. This is at odds with long-standing conservation of energy principles. To help find solutions to problems like these, the Next Generation Space Telescope is in development. Scheduled for launch in 2018, the James Webb Space Telescope is optimized for observations in the infrared and a scientific successor to the Hubble Space Telescope and the Spitzer Space Telescope. It will be almost three times the size of Hubble and orbit far from Earth in the Earth-Sun L2 Lagrange point. It will be studying the birth and evolution of galaxies and the formation of stars and planets. One particular goal involves observing some of the most distant objects in the universe beyond the reach of current ground and space-based instruments. These include the very first stars and the formation of the very first galaxies. All this reminds me of Edwin Hubble's own words in 1936. They are still appropriate today. Thus, the explorations of space end on a note of uncertainty, and necessarily so. We are, by definition, in the very center of the observable region. We know our immediate neighborhood rather intimately. With increasing distance, our knowledge fades and fades rapidly. Eventually, we reach the dim boundary, the utmost limits of our telescopes. There, we measure shadows, and we search among ghostly errors of measurement for landmarks that are scarcely more substantial. The search will continue. Not until the empirical resources are exhausted need we pass on to the dreamy realms of speculation.